Good morning. morning. Welcome to First NSB. It is a beautiful, beautiful day out there. I don't know if you guys uh, noticed that. How could you miss it, right? I mean, what a beautiful day. And parking was probably a challenge, right? Maybe a little bit of a challenge today. Art Fiesta happening just across the way. And um, I'm sure lots of people are at the beach. But I'm glad you're here. Aren't you glad you're here this morning? I mean, it is an awesome, beautiful day. Well, it's still going to be beautiful when we get out of here. So um, I'm glad you started your day here. And let me say welcome to any of our guests that are joining us today. We're so glad that you decided to be here on this day, whether you are just an out-of-towner who's visiting the New Smyrna Beach area, welcome. We're glad you're here. Or maybe you've recently moved into our community, or perhaps you've lived here for quite some time and you just decided to come to church today. Whatever the reason is, I am glad that you're with us today, and uh, I look forward to meeting you at guest services at the conclusion of our service, but good to see you today. Let me ask you to join with me in God's Word in Colossians chapter 3 this morning, Colossians chapter 3. That is in the New Testament, and uh, if you are joining us in the worship center and you did not bring a Bible with you, just look underneath one of the chairs in front of you. And open that Bible, and I'm going to give you the page number, page 573. I'm going to make it really easy, page 573. Now, if you're using your own Bible, uh, it's Colossians 3. Just go there, Colossians 3. I can't help you with your page number, but Colossians 3. We're going to read that in just a little bit. But here's, here's where we've been talking and where we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. We've been talking about our game plan or our strategy for how we go about accomplishing our mission as a church our mission is to make disciples of jesus so our strategy for disciple making and disciple maturing is to gather group give and go now i'm going to put it up on the screen and on the count of three let's say this together okay one two three gather group There you go, right? I mean, it's real easy, right? Gather, group, give, go. Four words, all beginning with the letter G. They're all verbs, and it's really easy to remember, but but, but the words are not as important as what they stand for, because what are we talking about? We're talking about how we at First NSB help people come to put their faith in Christ, and how we help those who have put their faith in Christ, how we help them to grow and develop as followers of Jesus. So what do we do? We gather for worship. That's what's happening right now. We've gathered for worship. We make it a priority, even on a beautiful Sunday morning, right? When we're in such close proximity to a beautiful beach, even when there's an art fiesta happening just across the way, on a beautiful Sunday morning, we still gather for worship. It's a priority. We group for discipleship. So here now we're talking about community groups, right? So we group in what we call community groups for discipleship that is growth in jesus we give to support the mission of first nsb now giving on the one hand involves our finances but on the other hand it also involves us giving through serving through using the spiritual gifts god has given to us by giving our time and our energy to support the mission of the church and then finally we go as everyday disciples this is where we live where we work where we play we're living our lives as followers of Jesus, in faithfulness, in obedience. So we gather, we group, we give, we go. Now today we're talking specifically about grouping for discipleship. Grouping for discipleship. Now discipleship is about growing as a follower of Jesus. So we don't just become a disciple and that's it. right? You don't just put your faith in Jesus and that's it. Now, I came to put my faith in Jesus at an early age. Well, that wasn't the end of my spiritual journey, right? I mean, I still am to grow and develop as a follower of Jesus. When Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, he said, I want you to baptize them, and I want you to teach them to observe everything that I've commanded you. So discipleship is a lifelong process. It's about growing. It's about developing. I am to grow as a, as a man of God, living my life for Jesus in my marriage relationship, as a dad, 
as a, as a member of this community. I am to grow and I am to mature as a follower of Jesus in my everyday life. So we group for discipleship. Discipleship is about growth. A disciple, as we've talked about, believes in Jesus. Right? So we believe the facts of the gospel. We believe in his sinless life. We believe in his sacrificial death. We believe in his victorious resurrection from the dead. We believe in his promised return. We're living our life. So a disciple believes in Jesus. A disciple lives for Jesus. We're living our lives in obedience. We're following Jesus. A disciple grows in Jesus. We're being transformed. We're developing. We're maturing. And then finally, a disciple makes more disciples of Jesus. We go and we help other people come to faith in Jesus as well. Well, let me share this definition from Dave Early and Rod Dempsey in their book, Disciple Making Is. Here's what they say. A disciple is a person who has trusted Christ for salvation and has surrendered completely to obey him. He or she is committed to practicing the spiritual disciplines in community and developing their full potential for Christ and his mission. So we practice spiritual disciplines on our own in our everyday lives. And we've talked about this, hearing from God through the Bible, talking to God through prayer, but we also commit ourselves to spiritual disciplines in relationship with others in the church. So, so let me highlight again from Early and Dempsey, their definition, they talk about a disciple being committed to practicing the spiritual disciplines in community. Right? This is, un, this is important for us to understand this, that, that God's design is for us to be in community with other believers. Right? God created us for community. God created us to be together, and so we are relationally connected. We're to be relationally invested in each other's lives. At First NSB, we're committed to large gatherings and small groupings. Right? Large gatherings happen on Sunday mornings when we gather for worship. Small groupings happen at various times throughout the week in various places. And so this morning, you've heard about community groups. And at the conclusion of service, we're going we're gonna to encourage you to go into the cafe. And if you're not in a community group, we're going to encourage you to find a community group to be a part of, to get connected with a group. So, so my sermon may be a little bit shorter today because I want you to have time and I want you to go and spend time looking at the available groups and finding a group to get connected with. We group in what we call community groups, right? So if, if, for instance, say eight people or a number of people in our church decide that they're going to group together in someone's living room or they're going to group together at a restaurant or they're going to group together at some space in this facility and they group together for the purpose of growing as followers of Jesus, encouraging each other as followers of Jesus. We would call that a community group. So we group in community groups. We group for discipleship. So let me encourage you. Let's read together Colossians 3. We're going to begin with verse 12. Here's what Paul says. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So here Paul is writing to the believers in Colossae. And he's writing to encourage them. And in this text that we just looked at, he's encouraging them to put on 
godly practices. Right? He talks about compassionate hearts. He talks about above all, put on love. So he's encouraging them to put on or to practice godliness in their everyday lives. But in the context, I want you to notice, if you go to the beginning of chapter 3, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ. And so they have new life in Jesus. They've, they've died to their old way of life. Now they have a new life in Jesus. And so he tells them in verse 5 to put to death the sinful practices in their lives. And then beginning with verse 12, he tells them to put on godliness. So the reason we group is for discipleship. And so we group at First NSB because we grow in community. We obey God in community. And we were created for community. So let's look at that first one. We grow or we group because we grow in community. Now, yes, we do grow in our everyday lives on our own as we pursue Christ through spiritual disciplines, but we grow in community. We grow together. We help each other to grow. Now, I want you to notice Paul's writing this letter. If you look at verse two of chapter one to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Now, that's brothers and sisters. That's all of the believers in the church. He's writing to the saints and the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae. He's writing this letter to those who have new life in Jesus, those who've put their faith in a crucified and risen Savior. They've been raised with Christ, and according to chapter 3, the beginning part of this, they are to seek the things that are above. They're to set their minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. They're to put to death the sin in their lives and they're to put on godly virtues. So we, church, grow in our faith together in community. Here's what Paul writes to the Ephesians. He says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Here's what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So their faith is growing, their love for one another is growing, their spiritual growth is a cause for thanksgiving. And then right here in Colossians, I want you to notice that verse 1, of, or, or chapter 1, verse 4, Paul talks about the fact that they always thank God when they pray for them. And here's why. Verse 4, he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. So there's a connection, a relational connection between these believers because they have a faith in the Lord Jesus, a common faith in a common Savior, and they have love for one another. They're relationally invested and connected with each other. Paul, Peter, urges his audience, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Back in Colossians chapter 1, here's what Paul prays. Look at verse 9. He says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. And what is it that, that Paul and his companions are praying for on behalf of the Colossians? Well, he tells us, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. So the prayer is that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, for the purpose that they might live their lives in a manner worthy of the Lord. And then he goes on to say, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. That sounds like growth. It sounds like what Paul is praying for them is for spiritual growth, that they would bear fruit in every good work, that they would increase in the knowledge of God, that they would be strengthened with all power power so he's praying for their spiritual growth and yes we do grow in our everyday lives on our own but we also grow in community 
as we encourage each other, as we challenge each other. But we also group because we obey God in community. These Colossians had relationships with each other. They were, they were a spiritual family. They were connected to each other. And in these commands of what they're to put to death and the commands of what they're to put on, I want you to notice there are some so-called one another's, right? So he says, do not lie to one another. He says that they are to forgive each other. They are to bear with one another. As they let the word of Christ dwell richly among them, they are to teach and to admonish one another. Notice the language of one another or each other. There's, there's in this this idea that they have a relationship with each other. They're connected with each other. They're invested in each other's lives. And it's not just here in Colossians 3. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we see commands to love one another. Right? Jesus says it in John 13 to his disciples. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Read 1 John. There are many times in 1 John where it talks about loving one another. The brothers and sisters are to love one another. Peter says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Right? The writer of Hebrews says, let us consider how to, how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet. Uh, together as is the habit of somebody encouraging one another so you have these one another's throughout the new testament and these one another's are are assuming a relationship between the believers right again go back to colossians chapter 1 verse 4 and paul references their faith in jesus christ and their love for all the saints there is a vertical dimension toward God, toward Christ, but there's also a horizontal dimension in that they are connected with each other. Church, God's design is for us to be connected with each other. We obey God in community. So if you look at the list, and, and, and just, just look at the list in verse 5, he talks about what they're to put to death. I mean, that's graphic language, right? Put to death, execute the sin in your life. Right, you've been raised with Christ. You have new life in Jesus. You've put off the old person. You've put on the new person. So you've got to put to death the bad stuff, the sin in your life. And so what does he say? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. Those are at verse 5. Verse 8, he says anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. He says don't lie to one another. And then he says, well, well, here's the things you need to put on. Here are the things you need to practice. Look at verse 12. He talks about compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Verse 13, he says, bear with one another, forgive each other. Verse 14, he says, above all these, put on love. Now, I can in my everyday life, I can and I should seek to put to death these vices in my life. I can and I should seek to put on these virtues, right? I mean, I, I should not be engaging in sexual immorality. I should not be get, engaging in, 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 sing, in, in sinful practices. I shouldn't be a person that, that, that shows anger. And I should be putting on a compassionate heart and humility and patience and love. I can and I should do thing, these things in my everyday life, but, but, but it's not just that I do them in my everyday life on my own. Putting to death the sin in our lives and putting on godliness is something that I do and it's something that we do together. Right? Executing the sin in your life is not a solo project. Putting on godliness each day is not a solo project. Yes, it's something we can and should do on our own, but it's also something we can and should do together in community with one another. Church, we group because we obey God in community. And notice further, look at verse 15. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. We are one body in Christ. I am not that body, you are not that body, but we are the body. 
He says in verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. We're to teach one another. We're to admonish one another. We're to encourage one another. And whatever we do, whether it's through our speech or it's through our actions, whatever it is we do, we should do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We obey God in community. So we group because we grow in community, and we group because we obey God in community together. In a book by David Mathis that I've shared with you before called Habits of Grace, he talks about what he refers to as the twin texts of fellowship. And it's Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, and Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Now, Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, we've looked at before. In fact, we looked at it last week in part. And, and here's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. He says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So that's Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And, and really the teaching there is that like, we, we got to give some thought and some consideration to how we can be an encouragement in each other's lives that we might practice love and good works. And that does not mean that we neglect to meet together. In fact, that's not how we do it. We don't do it by staying away from each other, but rather by encouraging one another. Well, then here's Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13. It says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Like, be careful. Be careful, brothers and sisters, so that there's not in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. I think it's interesting that he says that because we might think, oh, well, you know, I'm a believer. But I think we need to hear those words. We've got to be careful that there's not an evil, unbelieving heart that gets cultivated in us that would cause us to fall away from the living God. Here's what he says, but exhort one another or encourage one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So make sure that there's not in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Make sure that none of you fall away from the living God. Here's what's the antidote. Encourage one another, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. That none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And here's what David Mathis says about this text. Here the charge lands not on the drifting saint to get himself back on the path, but on the others in the community. To have enough proximity to him, awareness of him, and regularity with him to spot the drift and war with him, for him, against the sin. I like that word, proximity. This, this, this closeness. This awareness of what's happening in each other's lives. This, this relational investment in each other. Such that we can see when one is drifting. And we can lovingly compassionately plead with that brother plead with that sister to forsake that sin we can lovingly plead with them and urge them to be faithful to Christ we group because we obey God in community church we need to be close to each other we, we need to be invested in each other's lives and then finally, let me say this, we group because we were created for community. God created us for community. If you go back to the very beginning of your Bible, God created Adam. And after God created Adam, he said it is not good for the man to be alone. And so he caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and he took one of his ribs, and from that rib he formed a woman 
Eve and gave her to the man. Now in the context, we're talking about marriage. In the context of Genesis chapter 2, this is a marriage relationship. God says it's not good for the man to be alone, and so he gives the man Adam a wife, Eve. But it's not just the marriage relationship. God has created us as relational beings. We are created in His image and His likeness. We are created for community. We're created to have relationship with God on the one hand, and we're created to have relationship with others as well. I read a book several years back called When the Church Was a Family. The author Joseph Hellerman, he he argues that salvation is a community-creating event. And what he means by salvation being a community-creating event is the idea that when you get God as your Father, when you put your faith in, in a crucified and risen Savior Jesus, and you become a child of God through faith in Christ, you don't just get God as your Father, you get the church. You get brothers and sisters in Jesus. I mean, what what did Jesus teach His disciples to pray? Our Father in heaven. He's my Father, He's your Father. I've put my faith in Jesus Christ, therefore I'm a child of God. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you're a child of God, then if He's your Father and He's my Father, if you're His child and I'm His child, then that means we're spiritual siblings. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. When God saved us, God saved us to His spiritual family. We were created for community. Now, relationships are hard, right? If you're married, you can say marriage is an incredible gift, but it's, it's not easy, is it? Marriage isn't easy, right? You take two sinful people and you put them together and it's just total peace, right? No, it's not, right? My, my wife is great and she loves me and she puts up with me and, and she's really got to bear with me. Parenting is awesome. But sometimes the kids don't do what you want them to do. And sometimes the parents don't do what the kids want them to do. Right? Parenting is awesome. It's a great privilege, but but it can be a challenge. Relationships can be hard. Christian community is God's gift. It's an incredible gift, right? The church is God's design. But it can be hard, can't it? Relationships can be messy, right? And, we, and, and from a distance, we may not see what we'd see if we were close up, right? For some of you, your, your experience of First NSB is from a distance, right? You, you're coming to worship, and I'm glad you're coming to worship, but I want to encourage you to step a little bit closer. I want to encourage you to, to, to draw a little bit closer relationally, and that's where a community group comes in. Because on a Sunday morning when we gather for worship, which is, which is essential for our spiritual health and our spiritual growth, on a Sunday morning when we come in, it's, it's pretty safe relationally. Right? I mean, you can come and you can go, but when you get into a group, a group that's small, a community group, and there's maybe eight people there or 12 people there or 15 people there or whatever the size is, you might have to talk, right? You, you, you might, somebody might say, hey, what do you think, Mike? Right? People get to see you closer. You get to see people closer. And sometimes when we see people closer, we begin to see, hey, that person's got problems. That person's got flaws. That person's got imperfections. And we might even be a little bit afraid that if people see us up close, they might recognize, hey, we got problems too. We got flaws too. But we group because we were created for community. Here's what Dustin Willis says in his book, Life in Community. He says this, many argue that Jesus is all we need. 
And then he says this, while I agree that Jesus alone is all we need for salvation, I find throughout the Bible that the Christian life is designed to be lived with other believers. The church is not just an add-on that you decide whether you're going to add on or not. The church is central to your spiritual growth. Being connected with a body of believers, being relationally invested with other believers in Christ in a local church is essential. Commitment to Jesus necessarily involves commitment to the people of Jesus. So we group because we were created for community. So maybe you're not sure. Maybe you're not sure about this whole community group idea. I've already told you, well, the reason we group is because we grow in community. And we obey God in community. And we were created for community. Right, and we can look through the scriptures and we can see, hey, go to Acts chapter 2. The early believers, when they came to faith in Christ, on the day of Pentecost, they were converted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the prayers breaking of bread, the fellowship, right? We, we can look through the scriptures and we can see that, that, that there is this, there's no idea of an unchurched believer. But maybe you're just unconvinced and you're on the fence about it. You're apprehensive. Maybe there's some fear. Maybe you're just thinking, man, I don't have time for that. I am busy. It's enough for me to be here on Sunday morning. Let me encourage you to at least give it a shot. Take a chance. Right? We're going to wrap up here in just a few moments. And go to the cafe. And meet the group leaders. See the available groups. Just give it a shot. Are relationships difficult? Yeah. Can there be some moments of awkwardness? Of course. But the good of being connected with other believers in this church family, the good of being a part of a community group far outweighs any negatives that you might come up with. So am I glad you're here gathered for worship this morning? Absolutely. But let me encourage you to group with others in this church family. Because church, we grow in community. We obey God in community. We were created for community.